In this presentation, we will take a look at an example of a time ticket and the recording of a journal entry related to labor for a manufacturing company for a company using a job. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course, each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Cost system. So when considering a time ticket, we want to keep in mind, of course, that when we track the time of workers that are going to be working on a job, we need to be able to apply it to a particular job. The time ticket here is going to be used for us to track the cost so that we know the cost of the job. Now, of course, we also in a job cost system would be tracking this out probably to help us to build the job as well. They're going to be related in some way. But notice here, what we're trying to do is get to the cost of the job with the time ticket. Everything we're tracking here is the actual cost of the job. So when, when we consider the time ticket, then we're going to have, you know, any employee that works on the job and we're ultimately going to take their wages that we we pay them, which we usually record as wages expense or something or, you know, hourly wages expense to not an expense, but to the job to work in process. So that's in essence what we're doing here. We're tracking the time. We're going to apply that time not to an expense at the period in which we paid the employee or even in which they worked, but to an asset inventory, not expensing it until we sell the inventory in the form of cost of goods sold. So this is going to be a time ticket. We're going to have the employee here. We'll have the employee number if we have one. And then of course the job, that's going to be the important component, the job that we're going to assign it to. Uh, we, we, you know, we have this, the similar punching in the time in time out the time that elapsed the rate, and that'll give us the amount that we're going to apply to each job. Now, of course, this could be used in a computerized system. We could have a, you know, an old time ticking uh, tracker that we're that we're going to have. So uh, whatever way that we're going to use to format this, we got to make sure that whatever time we have, we're applying it out to the correct job so that we can then post this to work in process and have it be supported then by the job sheets. So here's an example of the job sheet. I'm not tying this ticket in directly to it, but it's just an example of a job sheet, then this is a particular job that's going to support all the work in process accounts, everything that's on the work in process in a similar way as a subsidiary account by customer supports what's in accounts receivable. The job sheets are going to report what's on the balance sheet, what's on the trial balance uh, for work in process. So in this case, we're talking about labor. So we're tracking labor here. So these time tickets are going to help us then to track the labor we might have if we're working a big construction job or something like that we might have you know multiple time tickets that we're going to have to track and we're going to have to apply them to these job sheets and note what's happening here again when we record the journal entry as we'll see we're not going to record it to wages expense meaning when we process payroll we're in essence debiting not an expense but inventory in the form of work in process supporting it by the job we won't expense it until we sell the inventory at the end of this process. So, so that's going to be what the time ticket function will be. Uh, and we need some format to do that. If we're just, if we're doing a construction job, then we got to apply that, apply it out some way. If we have a, a service, a, a bookkeeping company or a law firm, then again, we have to apply some way the wages out. Now, again, the billing is going to be similar too. If we had a, if we had a construction company or a, uh, a, a, uh, a law firm or something like that when we create the invoice we might have a billable rate which may or may not be the same as the as the rate that we're using to uh, apply the cost to the job but here again we're looking at the cost so we're looking at the actual cost meaning in other words this looks like a lot like an invoice we may use this to create the invoice we may take the bottom line number of actual costs as close as we can except for the overhead and mark it up so we might say now we're going to mark it up 30 or 40 percent and that's going to be our sales price or if we're if we're a bookkeeping firm 
or a, um, a bookkeeping firm or, or something like that, or a law firm, we might be tracking the time of our multiple employees. And on the invoice, we might be uh, having a similar tracking, but we might use billable rates that are different from the pay rate in order to, in, to create the invoice. That might be a way that we create basically invoices. But here we're tracking the actual cost of the employees here because we're tracking the cost of the job. Okay, so if we then took this to direct labor and we took all, all of these uh, labors that were applying to these jobs, we took all the time tickets and we applied them out to the jobs. So we have a list of jobs now that we're saying all these jobs now are listed out and we know the direct labor applied to them. In other words, we can think of it this way. If we're saying that the payroll for this time period added up to 5,000, that's what we have in payroll for, for these individuals, then we're breaking it out between these jobs that we paid for and this much is indirect that we couldn't apply to a particular job. So we're processing this now with a journal entry just like we would with payroll, meaning we're going to credit, we're going to say wages payable. In a simplified journal entry, it might be a credit to cash, right? Uh, or But wages payable will show us that it's for wages because we're processing payroll. And then the debit, usually we would think, well, it's payroll. It's going to go to, it's going to go to wages expense. And again, we're not getting, we're not getting into the withholdings and everything right now. That's a simplified, uh, payroll journal entry. And we're just going to say, well, the debit would normally go to payroll expense, but now we're going to say, no, it's going to go to work in process. Why is it going to go to work in process and not payroll expense when we're basically recording the payment of, of employees? Because the expense, isn't there just because it's payroll at the time we pay them. It's an expense because we used that work, that work in order usually to help us generate revenue in the same time period, the matching principle. Here, we use this labor not in order to help us generate revenue yet. It helped us to make inventory, which is work in process. It's part of the inventory. So the labor, the wages that we're paying is part of inventory. We will expense it when we're gonna expense it when we sell the inventory in the form of cost of goods sold. Then the other side, this is going to be the, the labor that wasn't applied to a job, meaning like supervisor salaries or possibly uh, maintenance in the, in the warehouse. We couldn't apply it to a job. So it just is going to go to indirect. So it's going to go, we're still going to go to wages payable because we're going to pay these people. And, uh, and so it's going to eventually go to cash that you can think of that as cash. We're going to pay them as well. It's going to go out of payable and then in the cash eventually. And then the debit's going to go to factory overhead. So it's going to go to factory overhead. Again, it's not going to go to wages expense because we haven't used it. It's going to go to inventory eventually. And we're going to have to apply it out from factory overhead to inventory in some way. So if we look posting the journal entry to the general ledger, we've got the work in process here. So we've got the work in process was at 2,230. It's going to go up by the 4,200 to 6,430. That then is what we have here, 6,430. Wages payable, so here's wages payable, was at zero, it's gonna go up by 4,200. And again, you can think about it as if we were paying cash, right? Uh, so wages payable is just gonna be an intermediary. Uh, if this was a very simplified transaction, uh, it would just be a debit to the work and process credit uh, to cash. And that would be similar to us, again, just processing the payroll. We're not dealing with anything else like uh, the withholdings or anything. We're just looking at uh, a very basic kind of payroll journal entry. The main thing to note, however, of course, is that the expense here is not going to an expense. It's going to that inventory account. We also note that book problems will often use a payable account when working uh, these types of systems because what they're trying to do is show us just with the journal entry without having to have a note in the journal entry that what this is related to and if we just debit work in process and credit uh, cash then just by looking at the journal entry we wouldn't really know what's happening so we use the payable now payable is fairly often used but we might see it in some other areas where it's less you know you something like utilities we might see a utilities payable or something like that because that helps us to know that the part that's going into work in process is related to utilities in that case and usually we wouldn't have a utilities payable because we would just pay the utilities. It would be a credit to cash. We might do it with a note. So just uh, be aware of that. So we're just processing the payroll here. Wages payable. Then we have the factory overhead. 1,200 was at 550. 
We're going to debit it 1,200 to uh, 1,750. That's the amount in factory overhead. And then we've got the wages payable again, which was at 4,200. We're going to credit the 1,200 to 5,400. So now we have wages payable, which we will pay soon. When we do so, uh, we will debit this, making it go down to zero and credit cash.